Okay, welcome back to the second part, the final part of um, input devices under the topic, um, the third topic, hardware for IGCC computer science from Cambridge. Um, this video, we're going to be looking at keyboards, we're going to look at microphones, uh, mice, and touch screens. Massive, massive part touch screens. Here we go. So as you can see, we are here, but halfway through the um, the third chapter, hardware. Say it's very, very big chapter. Okay, let's start with keyboards. Here is a keyboard. Keyboards are the most common method still used for entering data in a computer. Um, they are used as input devices on computers, tablets, mobile phones, and many other electronic items. The keyboard is connected to the computer either using a USB connection or wireless connection. In the case of tablets and mobile phones, the keyboard is often virtual or um, a type of touchscreen technology. Each character on a keyboard has a ASCII value. Some, obviously, keys you can see here have more than one ASCII value, depending whether you press the shift key down or the function key or the control key, any of these, or a combination of several keys to get different symbols. Um, keyboards are a slow method of entering data and are also prone to errors over keyboards are probably still the easiest way of getting text into the computer. Unfortunately, frequent use can lead to injuries such as repetitive strain injuries or for short RSI in the hands and the wrists. Ergonomic keyboards like this can um, help it overcome these problems. Certainly if you're gaming on a PC, um, you probably have something along the lines of this. Moving on to microphones. Uh, microphones are either built into a computer, all computers have got a built-in microphone, or are external devices connected through a USB port or using Bluetooth connectivity again. The, the diagram shows how a microphone can convert sound waves into electronic current, and it's that old faithful thing again. We need to do some ADC um, analog to digital conversions. The current produced is converted to a digital format so that a computer can, pro um, can process it and store it. For example, we can burn some sound onto a CD. So the electronic current output from the microphone can also be sent to a computer where a sound card converts the current into digital sound, um, which can then be stored on the computer. Obviously the following diagram, as you can see here, we've got a sound wave, um, analog sound wave. This is picked up by the microphone, by the microphone, and it is converted into digital values, i.e., binary. Obviously, to do this, we need something called an ADC. And if you've seen previous videos, we talk a lot about the ADC, the analog to digital converter. We move on again to optical mice. Now, back in the day, probably before most of you were born, mice had what they call a trackball or a wheel inside. Um, which rolled around on the t on the on a surface and um, was was controlled sort of as x and y axis and that was captured and and, and moved the cursor on the screen now um, I mean this technology looking here is about 30 years old um, now the optical mouse doesn't work with a trackball it uses tiny cameras to take 1500 pictures every second it's able to work on almost any, surf any surface, ideally black or white flat surfaces though. The mouse has a small red LED diode inside that bounces light off the surface onto a complementary metal oxide semiconductor, and also known as a CMOS, and that's under here in the sensor. The CMOS generates electric pulses to represent the reflective red light, and these pulses are sent to a digital signal processor. Processor can then work out the coordinates of the mouse based on the changing image patterns as it moves across the surface. The computer can then move the on screen cursor to coordinate with the signal sent by the mouse. So, an optical mouse has several benefits over the old system, the one from the 1980s. Um, no moving parts mean less wear and a lower chance of failure. There's no way of dirt getting into the mouse and, um, and destroying it. The old ones used to get covered in fluff and um, all sorts of problems occurred. Increased tracking resolution means smoother response. They don't require a special surface such as a mouse pad. 
And finally, we move on to touch screens and we can break this down into three sections, capacitive, infrared and resistive. So touch screens, very, very common. They're a common form of input device. They allow simple touch selection from a menu to launch an application and work similar to a mouse, but you tap with your finger instead, such as the guy at McDonald's here. There are three common types of touch screen technologies. Um, I've just mentioned those capacitive, infrared and resistive. We start with capacitive because this is the most common now. And these you can find on most smartphones, tablets, etc. Capacitive touchscreens are control displays that utilize the electrical properties of the human body um, as an input. When a finger or stylus, such as an Apple Pencil, comes into contact with a display, it detects when and where the display um, from the user was uh, touched it. As a result, capacitive displays can receive accurate input from very little, very light touches. Capacitive touchscreens are used in numerous smartphones such as the iPad and the iPhone. But how does it work? Well, it's working on an electric current from your, um, from your finger. The surface capacitive is a simple system. There's a thin layer um, of electrodes which lie under a glass surface covered in a protective film. Here's the protective film, we've got the glass substance surface and we've got the electrode film in here. Four electrodes at the corners of the panel, as you can see here, are providing electrical volt to the film. When a conductive material such as human finger is near the electrode film, there is a charge of electrostatic capacity. Measuring these charges, the controller figures out where a touch has occurred. The surface capacitive is often used on big surfaces since the touch sensing isn't really accurate. Well, it's not really accurate on big surfaces, but on small surfaces such as a smartphone or a tablet, um, they are more than accurate. Okay, so the advantages. High touch sensitivity and accuracy, as I've just said. Um, support for multi-touching. You can put more than one finger on and certain controls on an iPad, for example, you rely on you touching it with more than one finger or more than one hand. Um, sharp and vibrant images are provided. Um, they're reliable even if you crack the screen, which most mobile phones, certainly held by teenagers, have got cracked screens. They still work. Um, disadvantages, surface capacitive screens only work with bare fingers or a special stylus, such as I said before, the Apple Pencil. They are sensitive to electromagnetic radiation, such as magnetic fields or microwaves. If you were to hold a magnet near a, um, a um, near your phone, it might cause problems. Please don't try it. We move on to the next one. This used to be the most common type of touchscreen technology, resistive. It's a low cost system um, and, it's, was, and it's used for handheld computers. Um, personal um, personal devices, computer, consumer electronics, and point of sale applications. The resistive screen is popular because it is relatively low price, and um, it's able to use a range of input objects such as fingers, gloves, um, hard and soft styluses. The resistive touch panel is one which you have to use a little bit of muscle to get it going. You've got to um, put some pressure onto it as they work by applying actual pressure to the screen. Well, what does that mean? Well, as you can see here, we've got to press down in order for these two electrode films to contact, make contact with each other. I've put here, resistive touch is the most widely used touch um, screen technology. It might still be, but um, capacitive is taking over. A resistive touch screen monitor is composed of a glass panel as you can see here, as before with the capacitive, and a film screen. Each of them um, is covered with a thin metallic layer separated by a narrow gap, as you can see here. When a user touches the screen, um, the two metallic layers make contact, resulting in electrical flow. The point of contact is detected by this change in voltage. So the advantages and disadvantages. Um, they have good resistance to dust and water. They can be used with bare fingers, stylus, or even gloved hands. 
it's low cost and it's low power consumption but it does have low touch sensitivity you sometimes have to press down hard it doesn't support multi-touching if you press um, in several different areas on the screen it will confuse it um, poor visibility and strong sunlight and it is vulnerable to scratches on the screen certainly screens made of polymer made of plastics and the final one we're going to look at is infrared touch screens this is using some kind of a grid okay um, obviously with x and y coordinates infrared touch screens uses a glass screen with an array of sensors and infrared transmitters it relies on the interruption of an infrared light grid in front of the display screen these can these these touch screens can be overlaid on an existing screen to make the device a touch screen as you can see here there's got a, we've got a diagram here the sensors detect the infrared radiation if any of the infrared beams are broken for example with a finger touching the screen for example the infrared screen has been touched causing sensors shown in red to have a reduction in infrared radiation thus the exact position where the screen was touched can be calculated using basically a little bit like Excel like a grid reference X and Y coordinates as I mentioned before so where might we use this and how it might it be used well it's advantageous in terms of it allows multi-touch facilities um, it has good screen durability it's hard wearing the operability isn't affected by a scratch or a cracked screen great for sort of info points and um, POS um, devices in supermarkets the disadvantages however um, compared with the other two technologies we've previously mentioned the screen can be sensitive to water or moisture we can't really have these outside it is possible for accidental activation to take place if the infrared beam has been disturbed in some way if something accidentally touches it and finally sometimes it is sensitive to light interference that was a quick video but that is the end of input devices we've covered a lot in this short space of time so please please subscribe if you haven't already and I will get back to you very soon with output devices for this chapter thank you very much indeed and I will see you next time bye for now